after nine games, the world champion Gary Kasparov found himself one point down to the Indian challenger Vishy Anand. Clearly, this was a situation that Kasparov did not enjoy. When he appeared for Game 10, he was so pumped up, it was frightening. Gone was that warm greeting with Anand at the start of the games. Here, it was chilly. He didn't make any eye contact with Anand at all. Kasparov once again opened with pawn to e4, and Anand repeated the open Spanish variation that he'd played in game 6. And Kasparov again played this amazing peace sacrifice, knight to g5. His position in game 6 wasn't that great out of the opening, so he had clearly had something prepared for this game. Anand captured on c3, all as in game 6. Kasparov capture the bishop on e6 and, and recaptured. Pawn takes c3 and now queen to d3 and it was here that Kasparov played the new move. He played bishop to c2 so he's retaining this dangerous bishop. This bishop is the key to this game. Very powerful attacking piece. So he's sacrificing a pawn and then came this amazing move, knight to b3, sacrificing a whole rook. Apparently, bishop c2 had been a suggestion of Mikhail Tarls, and Anand's team knew of this move, bishop c2, but they'd failed to spot this idea, knight b3, sacrificing the rook. Anand captured the knight on b3, Kasparov recaptured with bishop takes b3, and here, if black wants to, he can take the rook. Well, in fact, Anand didn't take that rook immediately. Let's just take a look at a few variations to see what happens if he does play queen, takes rook in the corner. Kasparov said after the game it was his intention to play queen to h5 check. Now, this is a very crafty move indeed. So black can either play g6 or move his king. Well, if he plays the king up to e7... Then comes bishop g5 check, and then the rook on f1 on the next move will take the queen on a1. So king e7 is out of the question. The same would happen on king d8, and so that leaves king d7. And here there's a beautiful variation. Bishop takes pawn check, king takes bishop, Queen g4 check. And now black's king can dance all over the place, but it always gets caught. For instance, king to f7, queen f3 check. That is a very cunning move, because now if king g8, then we have queen d5 checkmate. So king e6, queen takes knight check. See what a problem for black it is once that pawn has moved to b5. And it, it meant that the knight on c6 is unprotected, and you'll see in many variations that that knight on c6 is hanging. So now bishop d6. So at least the rook on a8 is now covered by the rook on h8. However, white is winning back all its material, and it's a very simple win now. Pawn takes bishop. Well, there's just one move which is difficult for white. It seems as though black might be able to defend after a move like queen e5. But here there's a very nice winning move. White plays bishop d2. This is much better than any discovered checks with the pawn. Bishop d2 threatening the simple rook e1. And there's absolutely no defense to white's attack here. Instead of moving the king, black can play pawn to g6, and then the queen drops back to f3. Well, I mean, you might say, what's the point of checking? Why didn't white move the queen to f3 straight away? Well, here's the very clever point. Black has big problems defending the knight on c6. In fact, it's, it's pretty impossible. So black has to either give up the knight, or move it away and give up the rook. Well, let's have a, a look at a move like castle's queenside. But then comes queen takes knight, 
and Black's king has found no security here on the queen side either. For instance, queen takes pawn, and then comes queen takes pawn check. A deadly move. If king b8, then there's bishop to e3. Threatening bishop to a7 check, and if c5, then queen b6 check is going to be decisive. And if bishop c5, then queen b5 check wins. Alternatively, if king to d7, then there's a rather beautiful winning move for white here. Bishop f4. And if the queen takes the bishop, then queen takes pawn on e6 is checkmate. If black plays the knight back to d8, now we see the crafty point of forcing the pawn to g6 before moving the queen to f3. If queen takes rook in the corner, then it seems that black can survive by playing queen takes pawn, followed by bishop d6, and then castling on the king's side. Although black has returned the rook, his king at least would have found some security, and he would still be a pawn up. However, instead of capturing the rook, white plays queen to f6. Now we see the point of forcing the pawn up to g6. This is decisive. If rook g8, then bishop g5. So the rook on f1 now attacking the queen. And when the queen comes back into the centre, then rook d1. And that's decisive. If the queen moves, then the knight on d8 is hanging. So black must give up the queen. Bishop takes queen. And in this position, white has the queen against the two rooks. Well, normally this is a reasonable material balance for the rooks. But here, because of the power of the two bishops, and the fact that black's king is stuck in the middle of the board, and really can't find any security at all, white has a winning position. It's because of the loose nature of black's position, in particular that knight on c6, which is very often hanging in many variations, and the king, which is really quite exposed in the middle of the board, that black can't get away with taking the rook. Instead, Anand played the knight into d4, hoping to exchange off this powerful attacking piece on b3, the bishop. And here, Kasparov played queen to g4. And Kasparov was amazing. Kasparov was playing his moves absolutely instantly, banging out his moves and then retreating back to his dressing room. He was storming out of the soundproof booth each time, slamming the door. I mean, he looked like a raging bull. It was an amazing performance. Anand's position is really creaking now. There's a threat to capture the pawn on e6. So he thought he may as well grab the rook in the corner now. So then came bishop takes pawn on e6. And rook d8. And the clock times at this point showed that Kasparov used about four minutes while well, Anand had taken well over an hour, and the four minutes that Kasparov had used were really the time he'd spent running in and out of the soundproof booth. And now the world champion played a shocking move. Bishop to h6. Tremendous shot. So that now, if queen takes rook, king takes queen, pawn takes bishop, queen h5 check, King e7, queen f7 is checkmate. Anand is forced to move the queen back, but then Kasparov crashed through. Bishop takes g7. Anand finds the only move to keep in the game, queen d3, bring his queen back to defend against the check on h5. So Kasparov just bagged the rook in the corner and 
queen dropped back to g6. Well, this was the first moment that Kasparov stopped to think in the game. He took off his wristwatch and placed it by his score sheet, a familiar habit of his indicating that he's about to get down to business. His home preparation must have ended round about here, with the conclusion that white has an extra pawn, two bishops, he must be winning. Kasparov played his bishop to f6, then came bishop e7, then bishop takes bishop on e7, queen t takes queen, bishop takes queen, king takes e7. And in this position, Kasparov has a rook and a bishop against a rook and a knight, and he's a clear pawn up, and it's those pawns on the king side that eventually march down the board, and with some nice technique from Kasparov, he polished off the game. This was a spectacular performance from the world champion, but, as Kasparov admitted after the game, it had all been home preparation. He said, I spent two minutes during the game over the first 20 moves, but 48 hours beforehand. This game uh, helps me to restore the confidence, but I still have to solve many problems. I'm vicious, well, well, well prepared, and, uh, you know, it's not easy to invent all ideas like, like that in every game.